always watch when we have visitors and we're partaking of the elements of the Lord's Supper. It's de-alcoholed wine if that bothers anyone. You can, you can rest assured that you just did not drink alcohol in church if that, if that messes with your uh, sensibilities. Uh, what comes to your mind when I say the word wrath? One issue that, that, continues, that continues to dominate my conversations about God with believers and unbelievers alike is the issue of God's wrath. I'm, I'm convinced that, that God's wrath is one of the most understood, most uh, misappropriated, most misconstrued concepts in all of churchianity. I've, I've heard so many sermons uh, proclaim with, with boisterous vigor that God is a wrathful and vengeful God who demands justice for sin. We sang a song just a second ago. Um, that, that's a beautiful witness to the Christ. And, but if you're familiar with the song's lyrics, you may have noticed a few changes. Now, the ending line of the song, till he returns or calls me home, has some distorted eschatological implications, um, but that, that's a different sermon. That's not my point this morning. Um, but we sing, till on the cross, as Jesus died, the love of God is magnified. Instead of the wrath of God was satisfied which gives visions of an angry God who must be pacified. And the only only way he can be pacified is by the death of sinners or by the death of his son. You see, when when speaking about how, how many people see the God of the Old Testament, people have a hard time uh, reconciling that God with the, with, with the Jesus that they read about in the New Testament as if somehow God has, has changed over time and has gone from being wrathful and vengeful to gracious and merciful. One early church theologian, a guy called Marcion, was branded a heretic because, of, because his anxiety about how he understood the God of the Old Testament, a God of wrath and anger, and the New Testament God of love and mercy led him to, uh, to dichotomize the two as opposing forces or opposing gods. I've heard that same tendency in people that I speak with. I'm not denying the concept of God's wrath by any means. Though though I, I, I deeply desire for us to understand God's wrath in its proper context. And I believe that the passage before us this morning at least provides some kind of on ramp uh, into that discussion. Are you with me? Um, the passage last week. Uh, and the one before us today, uh, and the passage about prayer a few weeks ago, and the text about Mary and Martha, and the loving Samaritan, and the sending of the 72, and, and so forth, are, are all, all really woven together uh, with, with extravagant, colorful tapestry. And it, it's, it's building upon this beautiful picture of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, the Messiah of God. Uh, so when planning a sermon series such as this one, it's really difficult to determine when to break a passage or, or when to stop a passage uh, because sometimes those breaks just aren't all that good. Um, I've asked in our editing floor midweek Bible study. I won't promote it, but you're welcome to come and study the Bible uh, in the middle of the week on Wednesday evenings. Uh, um, but I asked in our editing floor Bible study Uh, who would be willing to just sit with me for eight hours and go through the Gospel of Luke? It would actually take probably a couple of those eight-hour sessions uh, to really get the sense of what St. Luke is doing instead of just approaching the text in these smaller like subtext and co-text that don't fit together from week to week for us. 
Um, only one person showed interest. Uh, one out of about, I don't know, 15. So if we have 60-ish here, we might have three that would come. Something like that, maybe four. <laughs> The problem is, though, seriously, that that we come to the Bible, we come to the text, we come to the scriptures uh, in these little sections, and and we lose the flow of thought. We lose the flow of the story that the author is trying to tell. So let me help a little. St. Luke began his gospel by telling the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth, the priest and his barren wife. Zechariah was chosen, according to the custom, to, to enter into the temple and, uh, and, and burn the incense of offering. And while he was there in the temple, uh, the messenger Gabriel came to him from God to announce the birth of, of his son, that he would have a son. And in his unbelief, Zechariah wanted a sign from the angel to validate the proclamation because he and Elizabeth were old, past child bearing years. And for his unbelief, then, Zechariah was mute until the birth of his son and his obedience in naming the child Iuanin, or in English, John. I don't know how you get John from Iuanin, but this is what we've got. Uh, um, St. Luke mentions signs throughout his gospel. That, that every miracle of Jesus acted as a sign of who he was. And throughout his ministry, Jesus went about freeing people from oppression of evil through, through healing the sick and casting out demons and even raising the dead. There were just signs everywhere attesting to who Jesus was. Uh, growing up in South Louisiana, we, we had a bunch of jokes about these old Cajun guys. I don't do this often, but I'm going to tell you a joke this morning. Aren't you excited? Uh, um, <laughs> uh, so uh, Boudreaux and Clarence lived across the bayou from each other, and they, they hated each other. So every morning, Boudreaux would go out to the end of the pier, and he would yell across the bayou, hey, Clarence, if they ever build a bridge across this bayou, I'm going to come over there, and I'm going to beat you up. And so Clarence would respond, Boudreaux, if they ever do build that bridge, you come on over here. So every day, for years, Boudreaux would come across, go to the edge of his pier, and Clarence, I'm going to come and beat you up if they ever build a bridge across this bayou. So it happened. One day, in the newspaper, there were plans to build a bridge across the bayou. And they started the construction and every day it got a little closer to going across the bayou and Boudreaux would step out as far as it would go and he would yell to Clarence, I'm going to come over there and I'm going to beat you up, Clarence. And Clarence would yell back every time, you come on, Boudreaux. So the day came, right? They finished the bridge and Boudreaux looked at his wife. He said, now, may woman, I'm going over there and I'm going to beat Clarence up. And Boudreaux's wife said, Boudreaux, you leave Clarence alone. And Boudreaux said, woman, I'm going over there. I'm going to beat Clarence up. So Boudreaux starts across the bayou. And about halfway across, he turns around and runs back. And he goes back into his house, and his wife says, My Boudreau, I thought you were going to go beat up Clarence. And he said, Woman, I'm no fool. I saw that sign, Clarence, 10 foot 6. <laughs> Signs. Last week, we, we witnessed the heinous accusation levied against Jesus concerning the authority by which he cast out demons. That, that some in the crowd claim that Jesus cast out demons by the ruler of demons, Be Beelzebul, uh, which is closely related to the title Beelzebub, a, a derogatory title for the gods of the nations. A title that, that initially meant uh, something like uh, the Lord of the Dwelling, but by the time of the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, uh, translated in like the 3rd through 2nd centuries B.C., uh, the, the term is, is translated uh, Baal Muon, Baal Muon, suggesting something like Lord of the Flies or Lord of the Dung Heap, because that's where flies are. Uh, the Gilulim of Ezekiel, 
uh, which is a favorite name of Ezekiel for, for Israel's idols, uh, is, is really a harsh word. It's usually translated idols in, in, if you were to read Ezekiel. But it's a really, really harsh word, uh, gilulim. Uh, it connotes something like idols made of round things. And those round things are dung balls. So the term could be rendered dung ball deities. You worship dung ball deities. Um, but actually, even, even uh, that term may not convey the full effect. There's one four-letter word we have for excrement um, that's much closer to the mark, but I'd get myself in all kinds of trouble if I actually read the Bible correctly on Sunday mornings from the pulpit because of our modern sensibilities. But I want you to see here that the, the indelible mercy of God in this. I want you to see the indelible mercy of God in this. The crowds accused Jesus of casting out demons, dung gods, by the ruler of the dung gods. That, that the reason the demons listened to the words of his mouth was because he was acting on behalf of their master. The, the crowds ascribe the vilest source of power to the most supreme source of good. If ever there was a moment in the life and ministry of Jesus for the sons of thunder, James and John, to want to call down fire from heaven, it's here. The crowds declare Jesus to be in league with the dung god. How does that make you feel? And Jesus responded to the crowds in grace by revealing their, the logical fallacy of their claim that, that a kingdom that is divided against itself cannot stand. The hostile one is not destroying his own handiwork. And then he went on to tell his accusers, if I, if I expel demons by the finger of God, then you know that the reign of God has come among you. In other words, if, if what I'm doing is by the power and the authority of God, then his reign has broken forth in the world, which should be evident by the demons obeying my voice. And that's where we spent most of our time last week in Luke chapter 11. But the second response from the crowds was to demand a sign. They wanted proof that Jesus was who he claimed to be. So after Jesus addressed the crowds who claimed that he was in league with the Lord of Scatology, Beelzebul, he turned to address those who kept demanding a heavenly sign from him. If you have your Bibles and you haven't turned there already, uh, turn with me to Luke chapter 11, verse 29. Now I'll, I'll read through verse 36. So when the crowds were increasing, he began to say, This generation is an evil generation. It asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so the Son of Man will become to this generation. And the Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them because she came from the ends of the earth to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. And look, something greater than Solomon is here. And the people of Nineveh will rise up in judgment against this generation and condemn it because they repented at the proclamation of Jonah and look, something greater than Jonah is here. No one after lighting a lamp puts it in a cellar, but on a lampstand, so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. If your eye is healthy, the whole body is full of light. But if your eye is not healthy, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, consider whether the light that is in you is not darkness. 
If then your whole body is full of light, no part of it in darkness. It will be as full of light as when a lamp gives you the light with its rays. Before we dive uh, into the deep waters of the sign of Jonah and the queen of the south and Solomon uh, and just what in the world Jesus is talking about with light and the eye and the whole body being enlightened, there's something that strikes me right away. Um, As the crowds were gathering and increasing around Jesus, he says to them, this generation is an evil generation. It it demands a sign, and no sign will be given except the sign of Jonah. No sign will be given? What about all the signs in Jesus' ministry? What about all of the healings and freeing people from the oppression of demons? There were so many signs concerning who Jesus was. Like right after his baptism, Jesus, Jesus went into the wilderness and battled the Satan. And after his victory there, he went to Nazareth, where he had grown up, and he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath. He stood up and read from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, which says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because of which... He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and and the recovery of sight to the blind and to send those who are oppressed out in freedom to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And then after reading the scroll, he, he rolled it back up. He gave it to the attendant of the synagogue and he sat down. And he said, today... This scripture has been fulfilled among you. Jesus Jesus considered himself to be the one who fulfilled the, the scripture of Isaiah 61 and 58. There's another prophecy in Isaiah that, that declared um, Yahweh's redemption to Israel. It said, say to those who are anxious of heart to to be strong, you must not fear. Look, your God will come with vengeance and divine recompense, and he will come to deliver you. Listen, this this is so good. Listen, then the eyes of the blind shall be open, the ears of the deaf unstopped, and the lame shall leap like deer, and the tongue of the mute shall sing for joy. When John the Baptist was in prison, seemingly anxious about his impending death, he sent two of his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who was to come or should we look for another? And Jesus responded to John's disciples and he said, go and tell John what you have seen and what you have heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news proclaimed to them. St. Luke has been so careful to record what the Old Testament prophets foresaw of God's deliverance, reconciliation, and redemption of Israel, and it was happening in Jesus. But in Jesus' response to John's disciples, one of the Old Testament prophecies of God's deliverance was left out. Did you catch it? Isaiah 35, 5. The eyes of the blind shall be open, the ears of the deaf shall be open, the lame shall leap like deer, and the tongue of the mute shall sing for joy. Jesus told John's disciples, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news proclaimed to them. Do you catch it? In verse 14 of of, uh, chapter 11, St. Luke wrote, and he was expelling a mute demon. And when the demon had come out, the man who had been mute spoke. Every sign 
that God's redemption had come in Jesus was there in plain sight. There had been many signs given, but Jesus told his disciples in chapter 8, quoting from another prophecy in Isaiah, that while seeing they could not see and hearing they could not understand, this generation is an evil generation. It demands a sign and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. And seeing they could not see. The crowds rejected the fulfillment of the prophets revealed by all that Jesus had done and kept demanding a heavenly sign from him to assuage all doubt. That they, they, they were seeing people who shut their eyes as if they were blind. Therefore, only the sign of Jonah would be given to them. But what exactly is the sign of Jonah? Jonah was an Old Testament prophet who God called to go to a place called Nineveh to announce Yahweh's judgment against the city. Nineveh was the capital of the the mighty nation Assyria, Uh, who were considered enemies by the Israelites, the the Assyrians were known to be a ruthless and violent people. Um, And the image that's brought about in Jonah, in in Nineveh, is is that uh, their wickedness had been personified. And that wickedness, that personification of their wickedness, had ascended into God's space before his presence. So God told Jonah to go and proclaim his judgment against them. So Jonah immediately runs away. It's never a good move, by the way. If God tells you to do something, you might, you might just want to do it. But Jonah runs away. Then you have the children's church version of the story of Jonah that focuses on the big fish incident, uh, which is really oblique in the story at best. Um, But then after the fish vomits Jonah up on the shore, God again calls him to go to Nineveh and proclaim judgment against them. He listens this time. Here's the message. Forty days and Nineveh, Nineveh will be overthrown. Forty days and Nineveh Nineveh will be overthrown. The Hebrew word, napaket. That is, the the, the city would succumb to destruction, likely by the hand of another nation. Because God often used nations in the Old Testament to enact condemnation against other nations for their wickedness. He uses other nations to enact judgment against Israel as well. So this time, Jonah has listened to the word of God, and he took a three-day walk through the city, proclaiming at the end of 40 days, Nineveh will be in the pocket, or overthrown. I remember my Hebrew professor telling this story, and so that's the word that's just always in my head. That's it. That's the message. There's no call for repentance, even if that's inherent. There's no explicit message of God's goodness, compassion, and mercy if they were to to turn to him. God's message to Jonah for Nineveh was that at the end of 40 days, the city would be overthrown. That's quite a feat considering how powerful Nineveh was or Assyria was at the time. But here's what's so fascinatingly remarkable about the whole narrative. Chapter 3, verse 5 of Jonah summarizes Nineveh's response. It says that the people of Nineveh believed in God and they proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. That's the synopsis of what happened. Uh, Verses 6 through 10 provide more detail as to how they responded. And it's worth reading. When the news reached the leader of Nineveh, He got up from his throne, he took off his royal robe, and he put on sackcloth and sat on ashes. 
Sitting on ashes or covering oneself in ashes and sackcloth was a sign of humble and mournful repentance in the ancient Near East. In verse 7, the, the king issued a proclamation and said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, no human or animal, cattle or sheep is to taste anything. They must not eat, they must not drink water. Every person and animal must put on sackcloth and must cry earnestly to God and everyone must turn from their evil and from the violence that is in their hands. And who knows? God may relent and change his mind and turn from his blazing anger so that we will not perish. Who knows? Do you understand how far Nineveh was willing to go to seek mercy when no overt message of mercy was preached to them? Do you understand how far they were willing to go? No person or animal shall taste anything. Put on sackcloth. Cover yourself in ashes. And this isn't, this isn't some notion of... of a, a personal repentance that we often speak so much about. This was the repentance of a whole city. From, from animals to people, complete and utter repentance. So the, the vision of the author of Jonah, uh, that, um, the, the vision that he gave is, is complete and total humility before the God of Israel from a nation that was not Israel or we would say Gentile. Is that how you've responded to your wickedness? To your sinfulness? See, I'm convinced that we don't understand the depths of God's mercy because we don't understand the depths of sin. Well, I want to draw your attention to two Hebrew words in, in Jonah. Um, in verse 8 of chapter 3, the ruler of Nineveh decreed that all the people and animals shall be covered in sackcloth and cry mightily to God and shall, shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence in their hands. And shall turn. It's the Hebrew word shuv, which, which connotes the idea of, of turning around or, or returning from where one has come or, or turning back or going a different direction. In the proper context, to repent. In verse 9, the ruler declared, who knows? God may relent. Shuv, and change his mind, Naham, De depending on the context, Naham can mean to regret or to change one's mind or, or to have a change of heart. And those two Hebrew words, Shuv and Naham, are, are so closely connected and they're used multiple times throughout the Hebrew scriptures, often of God's response to human intercession or repentance. Watch this. The, the, the ruler went on. He says, God may shuv, he may turn from his anger so that we do not perish. And then verse 10, when God saw what they did, how they shuv, how they turned from their evil ways, he changed his mind, Naham, about the calamity that he said would come upon them. And it did not happen. Because of, because of the message Jonah preached to Nineveh concerning the coming calamity, the Ninevites repented. They turned from their wickedness. They cast themselves on the mercy of God who in his mercy sent them a prophet to proclaim the coming calamity and they believed the word of the prophet with no signs or wonders. They humbled themselves before God and God nahamed. He changed his mind. And of course, Jonah was angry because he knew that's what would happen. That's why he ran away in the first place. Just a few verses later, Jonah prayed to Yahweh. This is a prayer. Listen, 
oh Yahweh, is this not what I said would happen while I was still in my own country? This is why I fled to Tarshish from the beginning. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love, chesed. I knew it. And I hated Nineveh. This is the God who is. The God who is is the God of mercy. So then, what sign of Jonah would be given to the evil generation to whom Jesus spoke? He says, for just as, the, just as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so the Son of Man will be to this generation. Jonah was a sign of coming judgment. And in the same way, Jesus, the Son of Man, was a sign to the people. A sign calling them to repentance. See, the tension in the story is will the Jews turn from their evil believe Jesus as God's Messiah and experience the mercy and faithful love of God as the Ninevites did. This is, this is the same message that God gave to the prophet Jeremiah to proclaim to Judah before the Babylonian exile. A message of coming calamity in which God told Jeremiah, it may be that they will listen Perhaps they will listen, all of them, in turn, shuv from their evil way, that I may change my mind, Naham, about the calamity I intend to bring upon them because of their evil doing. And when Jeremiah preached the message of calamity to the people of Judah, the priests and all the people heard his words, and when Jeremiah finished speaking all that Yahweh had commanded him, the priests the prophets and the people laid hold of him saying, you shall die. Does that sound familiar? See, the tension throughout the biblical narrative is how will the people respond to the message of the gospel? So whatever message Jonah preached to the Ninevites, whatever message was proclaimed to the ancient Near Eastern people in the Hebrew Scriptures, whatever warnings the prophets continually announced to the Israelites, inherent in the message, in its very essence, is the reality of mercy and grace. Mercy and grace for those who would respond in repentance. Hearing and obeying. To the proclamation of God's wrath, the proclamation of coming, of, of coming calamity itself is an invitation to turn from evil to the God of faithful love. The God who loved the world in the same way that he loved Israel, that he sent his Son so that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through it, it he would be, they would be saved. God is compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, and not letting the guilty go unpunished. See, the scriptures attest to this reality over and over again, that God forgives, shows mercy, and judges. And, and, and we really must hold these in tension, not in balance, because the divine cosmic scales are tipped towards his mercy. His mercy dominates his character. I heard a sermon recently from a prominent evangelical preacher I won't say his name, but a prominent evangelical preacher calling people who spoke about God's mercy but not having the same emphasis 
concerning his wrath, false shepherds. I'll just leave that there. God delights to relent. And we see that in him sending his son Jesus into the world. And, and the best way I can explain uh, the concept of God's wrath, uh, what, what I believe that St. Paul was getting at in his letter to the Romans when he wrote that God gave them over to a debased mind, that he gave them over to their evil desires, is, is the concept that, that is so prevalent about his wrath. That, that the wrath of God is a giving over to the desires of one's heart against God. A giving over to the autonomy that humankind has desired since page three of the biblical story. Which has worked itself out in chaos and calamity for all who choose it. As Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, Jesus, God's Messiah, would become a sign for the Jews, warning of calamity and calling them into repentance to experience God's mercy and grace and love. That is God's faithful love on display. And he has not ceased mercifully pursuing his people, longing for their humble repentance so that they could experience fully his mercy. Jesus went on in verse 31 and he said, The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them because she came from the ends of the earth to listen to the wisdom of Solomon and look, something greater than Solomon is here. So if you were to read 1 Kings chapter 10, the queen of Sheba, or as Jesus said it, the queen of the south, since Sheba is really far south of Jerusalem, the queen traveled far to validate a rumor she had heard about Solomon's wisdom. And then after testing him, she declared that not even half had been told to her. And then she honored Yahweh because of Solomon's wisdom. She heard the word of wisdom from Yahweh's king and she blessed Yahweh. She heard and obeyed. The crowds before Jesus had been hearing him preach. They had witnessed the remarkable signs, yet they did not believe. And Jesus said that the queen of the south journeyed from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and she believed. Yet something or someone greater than Solomon, someone possessing more wisdom, was standing right in front of them, and they didn't believe it. And by the witness of the queen's belief and their rejection, they would be judged and condemned for their unbelief. And then likewise, the people of Nineveh had a lesser prophet, a prophet who despised them, going so far as to try to flee from Yahweh rather than preaching to them, and yet they repented. Jesus went as far as condescending his heavenly throne, giving himself entirely as the lowest slave servant for the people according to the will of God. And the crowds rejected. Do you get the contrast? Jonah wanted to run and did run. Jesus confirmed the will of God and condescended his heavenly throne to be among his people, to save them. A greater wisdom than the wisdom of Solomon had come, a greater, more compassionate prophet than the prophet of Jonah had come. The Ninevites repented because of Jonah's message. The queen of the south listened to Solomon's wisdom and their example would condemn the crowds who heard Jesus, who was greater than both Jonah and Solomon. The evil of the generation failed to recognize Jesus' greater wisdom and authority. 
And I'm trying to be careful so as not to stir up anti-Semitic pre- prejudices. But, but the importance of Jesus' references to, to uh, repenting Nineveh and, and the listening queen would be lost without understanding the context. That, that Israel, the Jews, are the chosen people of Yahweh who are called to be a light to the nations by following Yahweh and his merciful vo- vocation to the nations. And the prophets continually called Israel to repent and, and follow Yahweh because they had turned from him and worshipped the dung gods of the nations. And then Jesus here gave two examples of Gentiles who heard and obeyed the word of God. And that theme of hearing and obeying continues throughout the Gospel of St. Luke, implicitly, as as presently in the story, or explicitly, as in verse 28 of chapter 11, when he said, "...holy satisfied are those who hear the word of God and highly treasure it, who, in other words, obey it." And the shame of Israel comes in the obedience of the Gentiles. Yet... God continued and continues to pursue his people Israel. If you've been in our Romans Bible study over the last 18 months, this is to be so vivid to you that much of St. Paul's writings, particularly in his church epistles, are drenched in the faithfulness of God to the Jews that they rejected him, they rebelled against Yahweh, they went after other idols and dung gods and everything else that they could worship, but his grace and mercy and faithful love pursued them. And that grace, mercy, and faithful love are also on vivid display here in the text as, even as Jesus admonishes their unbelief calling them into repentance. See, instead of faithful Israel standing in judgment over the nations, humble and repentant Gentile Nineveh and the wisdom-seeking and obeying Gentile queen will stand in condemnation over the evil generation of Israel for their unbelief. Verse 33, no one after lighting a lamp puts it in a cellar, but on a lampstand, so that whoever enters may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. If your eye is healthy, the whole body is full of light, but if it is not healthy, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, consider whether the light in you is not darkness. But if your whole body is full of light with no part of darkness in it, it will be as full of light as when a lamp gives you light with its rays. Did you count how many times light was used? (laughs) When uh, when I was a preteen, our family visited uh, some caverns in Arkansas, I believe. Uh, I didn't validate the story with my parents. I believe it was in Arkansas. I know the rest of the story. Um, I remember really being amazed by all the stalactites and stalagmites. Are you familiar with caves and caverns and stuff? And uh, uh, from time to time, though, the, the tour guide would, would turn off the lights, and we would just walk around by, with his flashlight. Like, so this whole group would just, with the tour guide's flashlight, to kind of give a sense of what the discoverers with their, with their lanterns and stuff might have been seeing as they walked through the caverns before it was lit up like our sanctuary. <laughs> Um, in, in the cavern there was this formation uh, really in the dim light and he even like, put his hand over his flashlight so you could get a better picture of what they saw uh, but there was, a, um, uh, there was a formation that looked like Snoopy laying on top of his doghouse it was really cool that has nothing to do with the sermon but it was really cool uh, at, one point, at one point in the tour though the tour guide uh, turned off all the lights including his flashlight, so that we could experience total darkness. Utter and complete darkness. I remember even from being a little boy, the darkness was so thick, it was palpable. 
And I don't know how long we, we stayed in the darkness. It seemed like a really long time for a small boy, but I was like picking on my parents and trying to scare people. And <laughs> couldn't go far, though. I couldn't see anything. Um, but, it, you know, you're a small boy. You do stupid stuff. But then in a moment, the lights came on in all their glory, and it was so bright, I had to shut my eyes and hold them tight because I couldn't bear the light after the total darkness. It's sort of like waking up in the morning in a really dark room and somebody turning on the lights. And and you're not able to, to open your eyes because it's so bright it almost hurts. Um, like at 4.30 this morning, when Ash walked into the bathroom where I was getting ready and hated the light. I mean, she's beautiful, but the face was incredible, that just trying to hold out the light from getting in. This is how many have responded to the light of Jesus that burst forth through the darkness. The parable continues to function as a warning to that evil generation that they they must watch out in case they fail to see the light standing right in front of them. Jesus was and is the light that had come into the world and many had and continue to close their eyes to him so that their whole body has become darkened. How you doing? See, in in a sense, blind Israel had been made to see, but they closed their eyes to remain in darkness. They, They were like a person who had a demon cast out from them, only to reject the one who cast it out, and the demon returned with more powerful evil than before. And all of this harkens back to the previous parable of the lamp in chapter 8, verse 16. No one, after lighting a lamp, covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in can see the light. For nothing is secret that will not be exposed and nothing nothing hidden that will never be known and come to light. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. For whoever has, to that one more will be given. And whoever does not have, even what that one has will be taken away. This is the condemnation of those who reject after hearing. However, the light is a light of judgment as well as hope. The one who has embraced the light will receive more. There's remarkable hope inherent in the warning that just as with Nineveh and the sign of Jonah, if Israel would hear and heed the warning, if if having seen they would repent, they would be full of light and no darkness would be able to penetrate. This is God's desire for Israel and everyone who is not Israel to see the light and, and not to close your eyes. I'll conclude with this. I think I'm way out of time. Not sorry. (laughs) I began our time with the concept of God's wrath, which is often misunderstood and misrepresented. Yet we have seen through the tapestry of Scripture, from, from the story of Jonah to the ministry of Jesus, that God's ultimate desire is not to condemn, but to deliver and to redeem. That, that his wrath is not vengeance, but righteous judgment, sodden in mercy, desiring that all would turn to him. So the sign of Jonah stands as a powerful reminder of God's call to repentance. Just as the Ninevites turned from their wicked ways and found mercy, so too does Jesus call everyone to turn from darkness to light. 
So his life, death, resurrection, and ascension are the ultimate signs of God's love and mercy, surpassing even the wisdom of Solomon and the warnings of Jonah. Because in Jesus, we see the fullness of God's character, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love. He is the light that shines in the darkness, calling us to open our eyes and hearts to see, to open our ears and to hear and obey. So I, as, as you leave here this morning, I pray that you carry with you the truth that God's mercy dominates his character, that he desires that all would repent and experience his mercy and fullness, his love and abundance, and his grace indelibly. He is not satisfied in wrath. Wrath is an act of mercy because in it we see the righteousness of God revealed calling people in mercy to himself. So I pray that we can go forth with open hearts to his grace, ready to repent and turn back to him whenever we stray. And then may our lives be a testament to the transformative power of God's love, a beacon of hope in a world that needs so desperately to see his light. Let me pray for us. Father, we praise you. We praise you for your love, your mercy, and your grace which you have caused to abound to us. May we never tire of hearing. May we never tire of seeing May we revel in the joy of your love. Make us to see. Remove our blindness. Penetrate us with light. Pray these things in Christ Jesus' name, our King, through his Spirit. Amen.